If you haven't started doing so already, this is a great time to start taking notes. Whenever you're listening to an astrology lecture or reading a book on astrology, and you're taking this study seriously, you really want to figure it out for yourself, uh, you need to write down what you learn. I have volumes of composition books where I've listened to lectures, where I've read books, and I've found things interesting that I've written down, and I go back and I review, and over time, the more I review them, the more I understand how they fit together. And this is especially true with very basic principles in astrology. The mistake a lot of people make is they just jump in to astrology and they get a book that says, this planet's here, this house lord's here, so it means this. And they don't quite understand how to determine if it's good or if it's bad, and they don't understand how to qualify what they're looking at. So these basic things, such as um, the quality of a sign, uh, whether it's active, passive, or the element, all these seem um, kind of pointless when you're in a hurry. But if you get these basics down, um, you will understand astrology much better. And when you get to later techniques, such as Varshaval or Prajna, um, all these things, all these, these fundamental pieces are used in these advanced techniques. For example, whether a sign is fixed or whether a sign is active or dual. Well, that might not make too much difference to you when you're just trying to consider the moon is in the fourth house. But if someone asks you a question and you create a chart for that moment, which is the Prajna technique, and you see that they're asking a question about their career and the sign containing the 10th and the ascendant um, is a fixed sign, that will tell you that there's going to be no change that whatever they're asking about doesn't matter because they're going to continue on the path that they're on. If they're asking about, um, say, a financial matter, will there be a positive change in finances? And you see that um, there is a strong active house um, getting triggered. Well, active is for change, which shows that, yes, there will be a change occurring. So all these little things, they might not seem as interesting to you, but if you get them in your head, when you get to a little more advanced techniques, they'll make all the difference and they can be very helpful. So let's start with the very basics, um, sign rulerships. Now each planet rules a sign and in Vedic astrology we do not assign um, rulerships to the outer planets. I personally do use the outer planets after about a um, number of years of doing Vedic astrology without them. When I was introduced to their effects I saw that they work very well so uh, we will explore those to a degree. Um, but they're not considered to rule a sign. But that's okay, because we have enough rulers. So let's start with, um, in a descending order, which planets rule which sign. So first of all, Leo is ruled by the sun. Cancer is ruled by the moon. Mercury rules Gemini and Virgo. Venus rules Taurus and Libra. Mars rules Aries and Scorpio. Jupiter rules Sagittarius and Pisces. And Saturn rules Capricorn and Aquarius. Now these all relate to the chakras, as um, I've mentioned. The sixth chakra represents Cancer and Leo, which is the sun and the moon. The throat chakra is ruled by Mercury, which is Gemini and Virgo. Heart chakra, Venus, Libra and Taurus. Third chakra, Mars, Scorpio and Aries. Second chakra is ruled by Jupiter, Sagittarius and Pisces. And the root chakra is ruled by Saturn, which is Capricorn and Aquarius. Some people give rulerships to Rahu and Ketu. Um, there's no consistent um, practice. There's, there's no con consistent consistency amongst texts about that. So what I've found, what others have found, is that Rahu and Ketu act like the planet that rules them, meaning that if Rahu is in Sagittarius, well then Rahu acts like Jupiter, or is colored by Jupiter's influence. So if Jupiter's good, Rahu will act better. If K2 is in Virgo, then K2 is acting like Mercury, because Mercury rules Virgo. So 
keep this in mind. You probably already know it if you've already studied astrology and Vedic astrology, but those of you who are new, beginners, this is worth noting because it's very important. Now, the next thing we need to consider are the active and passive aspects of a sign, and they alternate. So, for example, Aries is considered active, Taurus is passive, Gemini is active, Cancer is passive, um, Leo is active, Virgo is passive, Libra is active, Scorpio is passive, Sagittarius is active, Capricorn is passive, Aquarius is active, Pisces is passive. And what we note is that with these qualities, they alternate in the sense that odd-numbered signs are active, even-numbered signs are passive. And why is this important? Well, this is important because when a planet, a masculine planet, is in an odd sign or an active sign, it tends to do better. For example, the sun in an odd sign typically works better for the sun because that, in a sense, represents our masculinity. And if we're um, a male and we have the sun in an active sign, um, that's better for us to play that role. If um, we have a feminine planet in an active sign, there's a little bit of... Um, not confusion, but it just doesn't act as well. So feminine planets do well in passive signs. And according to Saravalli, I have a quote here. It says that male planets are considered stronger when in odd signs, during the fortnight of the waxing moon and during the daytime. Female planets are considered strong when in even signs, during the fortnight of the waning moon and at night. Now, what are the gender of the planets? We'll just touch that briefly. Well, Sun, Mars, and Jupiter are considered to be masculine planets. Moon and Venus are considered to be feminine. And Mercury and Saturn are considered to be neutral. So remember that. Take notes of that. And again, all this information is in the book, The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, which hopefully by now is available in print and also um, on Kindle, so you could find it there. And there are plenty of tables and reminders about these things. Now, the quality of the signs are important. Again, this comes more so into play uh, when we're doing something like Prajna. But we need to know what these are, and they go, um, they go in an order as well. So, for example, Aries is considered an active sign. Taurus is fixed. Gemini is mutable. All right, so it goes active, fixed, mutable. Then it starts over. Cancer is active. Leo is fixed. Virgo is mutable, or a dual sign. Starts over again. Libra is active. Scorpio is fixed. And Sagittarius is a dual sign. Starts over one more time. Capricorn is active. Aquarius is fixed. And Pisces is dual. Again, this will be more helpful in um, other techniques, but it's good to get a sense of this now. Now, what does that mean, active, fixed, and dual? Well, active means that these signs uh, are better at taking initiative. They indicate change. And fixed signs show a more, the word that comes to mind is stagnant, but I don't mean that. Uh, they're, it, it's more focused on keeping the status quo or holding things together, making sure it's preserving things to a degree. Dual signs can go either way. And they say that dual signs, typically, the first 15 degrees of a dual sign um, acts like a fixed sign. So planets in the first 15 degrees of, say, uh, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius, or Pisces will be fixed in their activity. And in the last 15 degrees, 15 to 30, a dual sign will act like it's active. And if we kind of conceptualize that, as we're going through the chart, we'll see Aries is active, Taurus is fixed, and then we get to a dual sign. So we're going from a fixed sign into the first 15 degrees of immutable, which is still fixed, and then the change occurs. And then it goes to active, and then the next sign that follows is active. So the, the mutable signs act like junction points. The elements are also important to remember. 
<clears throat> and these are important in regards to uh, determining the cast of planets. Um, it's important for uh, Ayurvedic analysis. Um, and certain planets work better in certain kinds of elements because they have their own element. So how does this go? Again, it, it has a repetitious order, just like all of these things. Aries is a fire sign. Taurus is an earth sign. Gemini is an air sign. And Cancer is a water sign. So those are the four. Fire, earth, air, and water. Then what happens? It starts over again. Then we have Leo is a fire sign. Virgo is an earth sign. Libra is an air sign. Scorpio is a water sign. Starts over again. We have Sagittarius is a fire sign. Capricorn is an earth sign. Aquarius is an air sign. And Pisces is a water sign. And again, this helps us to see how the plants are going to work. It helps us to understand the doshas of plants within uh, Vedic astrology. Um, it can help us, again, with prajna, with um, uh, locating objects. So there are a number of things that we have to note here. Also, some people associate, um, as I mentioned, the different castes with um, different elements. Some say that the water signs are the Brahmin class. Uh, some say that the fire signs are the Kshatriya class or the warrior class, that the air signs are the merchant class, um, and the earth signs are the Shudras or the servant class. And again, we don't need to get into caste debates um, because that got a little altered uh, through the Kali Yuga. It's not meant to be so that you're born into a particular family and so therefore that's the caste you're stuck in. It's really meant to assess a person and see, well, what's strongest within them? And if they are meant to be a scholar and someone who teaches others freely, um, then they're a Brahmin. If they're meant to defend others um, and to uphold the morals, uh, the law, the culture, then they're Kshatriya. If they're more interested in commerce, in fair exchange, um, in the economy, again, that's a merchant class. If they do better with simply serving others, doing a good job, um, getting their paycheck, going home and living the life they want, then this is a Shudra class. But anyway, we don't need to get into that. But this is all can be determined from the elements. Okay. So review this often. Make tables if you need to. Think about it. And even if you don't quite even if you don't quite see how it fits just yet in regards to chart interpretation, if you have it in your mind, when the time comes, when you get to that particular technique where we need to know these things, you'll have it ready. So don't overlook the basics. A lot of people who learn astrology do that, and they miss a lot. All right, so... <clears throat> Next thing we want to consider is how to read a birth chart. Um, I typically use the South Indian style. Um, I've already done a, a talk on this, but I will um, bring it back up for this particular uh, series. And once we get through that, uh, we'll start looking at the planets in particular, their qualities, their natures, what they represent within us individually. And as we progress, by the time we get to the end, you'll have a good sense of the planets, the signs, the houses, how they interrelate, um, and how you can start to use them to make an accurate assessment um, for yourself, for your own life or for helping someone else through astrology.